Hi, sorry for being late. Kadarating ko lang from work. So, how are you guys? And ladies and gentlemen. Wala gud mina bato na ini. Wala kini. Kailan dok? Okay lang po dok. Wala kini abnoy nga di ako lat nagiinakan. Okay, so Ganda mo itawo. Shall we start? <coughs> yes, dog. Okay, ano yung lahat? Ganda mo ko atang presentation. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. It's yours truly, Doc Josh, in the house speaking. Joke about it. Um, so right now we are going to continue with part two about um surgical infections. Okay. So as a recap, hello. Naririnig lang ako. <coughs> Sorry. Yes, po, Doc. So as a recap, last time what we have discussed was one. We have discussed about pathogenesis of infection. We have discussed about host and pathogen relationship. Then we've also discussed about the different definitions, the definition of SIRS and the tables. Uh, we've discussed about one, sepsis also, which includes tables with Q-SOFA and SOFA. We've also defined what is septic shock. And last time, we've also discussed about the preventive measures to um lessen the risk of SSI or surgical site infections and also the management for surgical infections. We have discussed about the te therapeutic modalities that are involved. And one of those we have mentioned was source control, then antibiotic therapy, then re-evaluation of the patient. We've also mentioned about um, the different uh, parameters to know if the patient is improving or not. Okay? So now we'll continue with part two of surgical infection. So our topic is about infections of significance in surgical patients. So we can discuss infections per se as broad since surgery man tayo, surgery ng pag-usapan natin, tama? So first up is surgical site infection. So, it is defined as surgical wound draining purulent material or if the surgeon judges it to be infected and opens it. Okay? It has to be the surgeon who did the operation who will say that this wound which he or she created is infected. Okay? <clears throat> so, surgical wound are infections or all are also defined as infections of the tissues, organs, or spaces exposed by the surgeon during performance of an invasive procedure. So kapag ordinary wound lang siya doon, wala kang ginawa, it's not a surgical site infection. But if you did something to it, like for example, you debrided it, you did suturing on that part, and nag-infect siya, you found that it is red, there, there is purulent material there. <clears throat> draining on that area that is now called surgical site infection. And surgical site infection can be classified as either incisional or organ space infection. So when we say organ space or space infection, word organ, meaning it can be any organ or space, any cavities like the abdominal cavity, the chest cavity, etc. Or if we, Juan, surgical site infection can also be classified based on incisional. Incisional, it can be classified also as according to superficial and deep. Okay? So when you say superficial, meaning it involves only the skin and the subcutaneous tissue. When you say deep, that is below. Okay? So, depende kung saan ka yung area. Like, for example, kung sa extremities lang, 
Basta skin and subcutaneous lang, superficial yan. Below, fascia, muscle, bone, deep na yan. Kung sa abdomen naman kayo, fascia, muscle, peritoneum, and even down to the internal organs, deep na din yan. Okay? <clears throat> Now, the factors that Uh, matters for the development of surgical site infections can be either number one, the degree of microbial contamination of wound during surgery. So that is why we ask our patients to bathe first prior to surgery. If you could remember, uh, we have discussed the modalities that prevents SSI, which number one, uh, we ask the patient to bathe. Number two, we prep the skin of the patient with either a a non-alcohol based or an alcohol based based on the area kung saan nyo ipaprep so as to decrease the number of uh, inherent microbes or to decrease the number of micro microflora na um, <clears throat> staying on that area so that is number one degree of microbial contamination of wound during surgery number two duration of the procedure of course the longer the procedure The longer, uh, uh, the more time it takes na mag-proliferate na naman yung bacteria. Remember that these microbes continue to divide as time goes by. That is why the indication of, if you have clearly remembered during our previous discussion, we also, we mentioned about preoperative antibiotics. Tama? Ano nga ulit yung, kapag wala ka nang may sagot, anong isasagot mo na antibiotic for preoperative antibiotic? Ano yun, Dok? Dr. Santos, what have you said? Amoxicillin, Dok? No. It was amoxicillin. Okay? Pag wala na kayong masagot sa board at tinanong kayo, what is, uh, what, what antibiotic should you give for this type of procedure? Ang sagot, cefazolin. Pag, kuan, pag yung patient allergic sa penicillin antibiotics, ang sagot, clindamycin. Okay? So next, duration of the procedure. In connection to this, we have to know the, <clears throat> di ba dapat nating malaman kung uh, what is the half-life of the drug. Okay? Kasi the longer your procedure, the more top-ups of antibiotic you will give. Like for example, if your procedure is one to two hours, one dose of cefazolin is enough. But if your procedure would go around three or four, since ang cefazolin mo, yung half-life niya is just uh, one hour, one to two hours, magta-top up ka na ng another dose of cefazolin. So this is in connection with the duration of the procedure. Again, the longer your procedure, the more time you give for the microflora to divide, increasing the number of the pathogens available on the site. Now, next are the host factors. Ito, inherent ito sa host. That is why um, these preventable uh, diseases should be addressed prior to surgery. Like, for example, diabetes. We all know that hyperglycemia would increase the risk of developing surgical site infection. And malnutrition is another uh, <clears throat> independent and it is very preventable. Okay? So if the patient is small nourished, hindi niya kayang mag uh, load ng uh, ano tawag doon? Um if the patient is small nourished, hindi niya kayang mag-produce ng antibodies. Okay? Kasi kulang na nga siya sa nutrients, kulang siya ng energy expenditure, kulang siya ng napakaraming one for him or her to produce uh, to uh, mount a systemic response that is why for mal for patient with malnutrition when they sometimes um, they are already septic which is hindi pa sila nag fever pero they already have subtle signs of sepsis okay at this point you can hindi niyo pa yan magigets kasi you haven't seen patients in uh, wala pa kayong nakikitang patients but some of these patients who are severely malnourished They already have so uh, they already have signs of infections 
based on your clinical findings, but then these patients would not yet present with fever or wala pa siya lang leukocytosis, pero decreased na yung ibang parameters nila. So that is why when you have your patients and you're entertaining infection in the patient, that is why important ang SEERS guidelines, the Q-SOPA and the SOPA. Kasi you will base it on those assessment if you will say that your patient is already septic or not. Okay? Obesity. Now again, for people who are obese, ang kapal-kapal masyado ng kanilang subcutaneous tissue. Okay? Again, for people, the subcutaneous tissue is a very, very uh, one, <clears throat> fertile ground for micro, uh, for um, for our microbes to proliferate. Number one, because it's fat. Number two, because the subcutaneous tissue is very low on blood supply. Puro fat lang siya dyan. Konti lang ang blood supply dyan. So, konti lang din ang nakakarating na immune system natin. Okay? All the different responses. And next, we all know the immune suppression. Kasi, wala silang immune system. <clears throat> okay? So, the next slide is just a table here. I just lifted it from Schwartz. Again, disclaimer, guys. Everything that I am talking here, I took it from Schwartz. Okay? Hindi na ako kumuha sa Cameron. Hindi na ako kumuha sa um, Sabiston para isa lang ang mabasahin niyo. When it comes to exam, the Schwartz lang din ako kukuha. Because sa boards niyo, Schwartz lang din ang lalabas. Okay? <clears throat> so here, in this table, we classify wounds as to class 1, class 2, class 3, class 4. Class 1 is clean. Class 2 Two is clean contaminated. Class three is contaminated. Class four is dirty. Again, this is very important to define what type of wound do we have on this on our patients. Because it would dictate you as to what is your management for the wound. Okay. So yeah, I'll discuss it further. So for class one, these are just wounds that doesn't perforate or does not involve a hollow viscous that contains microbe. Okay? So, wala siyang hollow viscous. So, what are those hollow viscous? So, number one, yung esophagus. Number two, stomach. Number three, small intestine. Number four, large bowel. Number five, rectum. Okay? So, another is gallbladder. So, those are hollow viscous. So, pag hindi yun na perforate yung mga ganun, only for abdominal procedures, ha? <clears throat> for those na hindi sila na perforate, it is still considered as clean wound. So, another is an incision that you make is a clean wound. Okay? Kasi you have prepped it and wala kang na-perforate. For simple excision, for simple, like this one, eh? yung in-examine nito, hernia repair, um, breast biopsy or and even MRM. Those are clean wounds. Okay? So, for class 2, these are incisions which you were able to perforate a hollow viscous with indigenous flora. Na open mo siya but under controlled circumstances without, again, I will specify the without significant spillage of contents. Okay? <clears throat> so, halimbawa, nagbukas ka ng one, you did a cholecystectomy or removal of the gallbladder. And, when you opened, uh, when you ligated the kuan, ay wait, nag-cholecystectomy ka, tapos nag-colangiogram ka. So, when you're doing colangiogram, you open the cystic duct Doon mo ipapasok ang uh, catheter para gumawa ng colangiogram. Again, may lalabas konting bile. Now, this is an example of a clean contaminated case. Kasi supposed to be clean siya kasi hindi mo naman ipaperforate yung gallbladder. However, nung nag-IOC ka na or nag-colangiogram ka, may lumabas konting bile. So that is an example of a clean contaminated Okay? It's supposed to be clean, pero na-contaminate ng konti. Okay? Again, elective procedures, like for example, 
um, colonic procedures like colonic mass, colonic tumors, tapos magdo-colectomy ka. Again, um, this is a clean procedure. Pero dahil nabuksan mo ang bowel and you did not have significant, meaning konti lang yung lumabas na poops or fecal content, um, kun na contaminate siya but controlled ang contamination mo okay so that is why clean contaminated or class 2 now when we say contaminated or class 3 these are open accidental wounds encountered okay <clears throat> like for example na butas mo ang bawel lumabas ang tae that is already a contaminated wound kasi lumabas ang maraming tae but then again um, tae pa lang yan. Pag nawash mo yan kaagad, wala pa, hindi pa nag, uh, hindi pa nag-overgrow ang bacteria. Okay? So it's still a contaminated wound. And trauma cases, like for example, stab wound, pero nadala ka agad sa hospital within 6 hours. So meaning, kuan pa rin siya. It is still a contaminated wound. Okay? Kaya, meron siyang presence ng microbes pero there is no gross purulence. So that is why it is a contaminated wound. So how it is differentiated from class 4 or dirty class pag may purulent material na, pag may nana. Kasi meaning it is very, very loaded with so much microbes and soil. Okay? Pag may soil, pag may nana, dirty wound na yan. Okay? So again, what, why do we have to classify wounds as to clean, clean contaminated, contaminated, or dirty? This would tell you what to do to this wound. <clears throat> like for example, if you repair mo ba siya or you will do not, if you will not repair, you can either do primary closure, secondary, or tertiary closure. When you say primary, meaning tinahin mo siya, you suture the wound. When you say secondary, you just leave the wound to heal by itself. Okay? When you say tertiary or delayed primary closure, you leave it to granulate and when there is no longer signs of infection or granulated na siya, wala nang nana, you then close it. That is tertiary. So now, based on the classification, you will see that there is percentage of infection rate. So for clean wound, 1-2% to 2 lang na mag ssi siya. That is why we close primarily these wounds. Okay? For clean contaminated, for GI, it goes up to high, how high as up to 14%. So, pwedeng mag-infect. Take a look. Mas mataas ang infection rate niya sa dirty. But again, it still depends on the kuan of the surgeon. Okay? And the preference at the surgeon. Kung sa tingin niya, hindi bride niya mag mabuti or na clean niya mabuti yung wound and the wound is not uh, that long before niya na disinfect ang wound. Now, what is the management for this? Uh, what are the factors that would lessen SSI? Again, we have, the, we have discussed this previously, which is intraoperatively, number one, we have to maintain euglycemia or normal blood sugar uh, blood sugar level of the patient during in uh, operation okay that would be less than 200 mg per deciliter and another one we should prevent hypothermia on the patient that is why treat the patient and adequate oxygenation both intra op and post op okay so what is the management for ssi Again, paulit-ulit lang to, paulit-ulit. Number one, source control. So pag hindi mo tinanggal ang purulent material or hindi mo tinanggal ang source of infection, walang kwenta kahit magbibigay ka ng antibiotic on these patients. Okay? So for simple abscess lang, you can just simply drain the abscess and debride the necrotic area. Then just do daily dressing. No need for antibiotic unless... If there is evidence of significant cellulitis and there is a manifestation of sears again. What are sears? Ano ulit ang sears? 
At least four lang yon. Sige nga, who remember? Hmm. Yan, may nakita ko. Dr. Coritana. What are those manifestations of Sears? Again? Manifestation doc of Sears? Yes. On temperature? WBC, tachycardia, tachypnea. Very good. So, hyperthermia, <clears throat> leukocytosis or uh, leukopenia, then tachycardia and tachypnea. Okay. So, we now go to the intra-abdominal infections. <clears throat> So, when you say peritonitis, it is microbial contamination of the peritoneal cavity. Okay? It can be classified as to either primary, secondary, and tertiary. When you say primary, meaning doon mismo nag-originate. But then again, it is still secondary. Pero primary siya in a sense na hematogenous ang spread niya or direct inoculation by a tuan by a prosthetic okay example uh, number one, for direct inoculation yun yung mga patients with renal problem who are on peritoneal dialysis nagiinfect ang catheter na ginagamit for peritoneal dialysis that is an example of a primary peritonitis an exa another example of a primary peritonitis is um, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis wherein there is uh, decrease in the function of your uh, peritoneum. Yung, kanya, yung peritoneal barrier is dysfunctional, there is uh, bacterial translocation to the peritoneal cavity. Kaya, nag spontaneous peritonitis. Bacterial peritonitis. So, usually for primary uh, peritonitis, this is monomicrobial, and the treatment for this is just antibiotic therapy. Again, before you say it's primary, you have to rule out secondary causes. So, para siyang waste basket diagnosis. Now, before you are able to uh, say that it is a primary intra-abdominal infection, you have to rule out all possible causes of intra-abdominal infection, which is the secondary. So what are the causes of secondary? It is either perforation of, the, of an organ or severe inflammation of an intraperitoneal organ. So example is appendicitis. That is a severe, uh, so purative appendicitis would produce a localized peritonitis. Another, another is um, pancreatitis. It would also produce uh, peritonitis in the patient. Another is perforation of the bowel. Either bowel, small or large, it would produce peritonitis in the patient. Okay? Now, for this secondary, hindi antibiotic ang treatment. Rather, source control. <coughs> in a way, kung, ba, kung ano ang pathology. If it is appendicitis, you do appendectomy. If it is ruptured diverticulum, you do resection. If it is... Uh, um, iliate, perforated ileitis, you do resection. If it is pancreatitis, depending. If it is, uh, what we call that one, necrotizing pancreatitis, you do necrosectomy. Okay? So again, that is, the, the main treatment is source control. Adjunct lang ang antibiotics. <coughs> okay? So, next would be tertiary. When we say, now, by the way, the intervention is <coughs> source control, antibiotic, and sometimes we leave a drain. So, what is a drain? It can in the form, it can be in the form of a Penrose drain, o yung mahaba lang, or a Jackson Pratt, yung mukhang granada, a hemobac, which looks like a landmine, and many more. Again, when do you remove the drain? It is when it has served its purpose. 
So, when the purpose of the drain is to drain the ascites, saka mo lang siya tatanggalin kung walang, hindi na siya nag-ascites. Kung the purpose of the drain is to uh, drain the uh, suppurative material in the abdomen, so, saka mo siya tatanggalin when the patient have already improved, when the drain is already less than 20 cc per ml per day, oh, less than 20 cc per day, and when the patient shows improvement, meaning wala na siyang signs of sears. Okay? Now, there is also another uh, classification of intra-abdominal infection, which is tertiary, which is common in immunosuppressed patients in whom the peritoneal host defense do not effectively clear or sequester the initial secondary microbial peritoneal infection. Meaning, if you have already done source control, naka-antibiotic ka na, meron pa rin spontaneous infection on patient. And usually, this happens to those immunocompromised patients. Okay? So next would be organ-specific infection. So, Organ-specific, from the word itself, one of mga organs. So, either hepatic abscess, clinic abscess, pancreatic infections, skin and, uh, skin and soft tissue, yung mga infections from the bowel, etc. Okay? So, hepatic abscess, usually it is 80% pyogenic. And dati yung common cause is manipulation of the biliary tract. But now, <coughs> dito sa atin, pinaka-common pa rin ang bacterial. Okay? Followed by um, tuan, uh, uh, amoebic abscess. Okay? According to the book, it is just it is 80% pyogenic and only 20% is parasitic or fungal. Smaller abscess, we just leave it medically treated. Okay? But for largest ab larger abscess, more than 100 cc, hindi na yan magre-resolve on its own. Kaya we have to drain it either per, uh, percutaneously or we open the abdomen. Depende. But then again, morbid kapag binubuksan mo if you open the abdomen. Kasi more complications compared to draining it percutaneously. Now, when do you do percutaneous drainage? So, number one, kapag uh, accessible siya and walang may injure na organ. Okay? <clears throat> so, next would be uh, splenic abscess. Now, splenic abscess is very rare. And usually, the treatment for splenic abscess is splenectomy. Okay? Now, again, there are so many complications also when you do splenectomy. Because the spleen is an... Um, is a... In an, uh, is an organ, uh, matawag ito? sorry, I forgot the term, um, is part of your immune system organ. Okay? Tama bang term? Sorry, sorry. Uh, basta, ganon. Okay? So, the spleen is an immune organ. So, doon maraming mga lymphocytes. Okay? And usually, pag tinatanggal ang spleen, the patient is very prone to... Uh, um, encapsulated infection oh, infection from encapsulated organisms. So they usually, some of these patients would develop OPSI or overwhelming post-splenectomy infection. Okay? That is why patients who are uh, one, subjected for splenic abscess or splenic splenectomy, kung elective siya, we give the we give the patient vaccination for encapsulated organisms 14 days prior. Or kapag emergency procedure siya, like for example, in cases of trauma, we do the, we do the vaccination 14 days after the splenectomy of patient. Okay? Now, another is secondary pancreatic uh, infection. So, this 10%, this complies of 10% of those who develop severe pancreatitis, pancreatitis with necrosis. It has high mortality rate. Okay? Pag ang patient develops a severe necrotizing pancreatitis, para yang kuan, para yang nilalagyan namin ng sipper sa chan. 
with the bride now and after some time magde-develop na naman ng necrosis ang pasyente bubuksan mo na naman ulit yung chan tapos uh, you the bride again then after so many times na naman magde-develop na naman yung patient ng necrosis the bride na, na ulit so bukas ka lang ng bukas sa abdomen ng patient and usually patients who are developing pancreatitis we start them on enteral feeding at once <coughs> so, due to decreased development of infected pancreatic necrosis due to decreased gut translocation of the bacteria. Okay? So, halimbawa, ang patient is nagpancreatitis and the patient uh, improved tapos nagdevelop ng sears, expect that probably the patient is having secondary pancreatitic infection. Or if the patient improves from pan pancreatitis, umuwi, after 2 to 3 weeks, bumalik, who is developing sepsis, again, expect the patient might be having secondary pancreatic infection. Okay? And the gold standard for, pancre uh, for secondary pancreatic infection is uh, necrosectomy. Open necrosectomy. Kasi when... Kapag open siya, mas marami ang nai-expose mo na areas, mas marami kang matatanggal na necrotic areas. Although, highly morbid ang open necrosectomy. Kasi, bukas siya eh, malaki yung wound ng patient. And, mataas ang mortality rate pa rin ito. Now, there have been studies of laparoscopic approach and endoscopic approach of necrosectomy and lumbar approach. Pero still, the gold, the gold standard is open necrosectomy. Now, if you can delay the procedure, halimbawa, um, kaya mo pa, the patient is still stable, kaya mo i-control, best is to delay the intervention for up to four weeks due to high morbidity risk kung buksan mo siya kaagad. Now again, as I have said, it requires multiple debrid debridement. <clears throat> So next would be skin and soft tissue infections. For skin and soft tissue infections, so you can classify it as, it as either simple and complicated. So this skin and soft tissue infection can be classified as the area kung saan siya nag-infect. For simple, uh, examples would be cellulitis, erysipelas, lymphangitis, folliculitis, coronal. Okay? And the management for this is the simple drainage. No need for antibiotic unless hindi siya nagre-resolve. <coughs> Next would be complicated. For complicated skin and soft tissue infection, again, it is kung ano yung nag-infect. For kung fascia ang nag-infect, it is considered or oh, it is termed as necrotizing fasciitis. Kung sa perineum naman nag-infect, it is called as corneas gangrene. Kung muscle naman, it is called as myonecrosis. For complicated soft tissue infection, there is very high mortality rate. Okay, if it is left untreated, there is 80 to 100 percent mortality rate. Even though if it is treated, there is still 20, 16 to 24 chance of mortality for this patient. Okay? So, the common sites. So, these are numbered according to the most common down to the least. Okay? So, first would be the extremities. Next would be the perineum. Third would be the trunk. And fourth would be the torso. So, characteristics of soft tissue infections. There is... Uh, there is a sinus which drains a grayish, turbid, semi-purulent material. Okay? Mukha siyang nana pero hindi. Mukha siyang rice water na nag-drain sa sinus. Expect a, probably a complicated soft tissue infection. Presence of skin changes like purpura, um, redness, red, then if there are blebs, crepitus. Yung crepitus is like foam when you touch on uh, when you palpate on the skin of the patient and you feel that there's somewhat a foamy texture or foamy uh, characteristic. So that is a crepitus, okay? 
if there is crepitus on the skin, expect walang air sa skin. Remember, the crepitus denotes that there is air in the subcutaneous tissue. Okay? So if there is, remember, walang air dyan. There should be no air on that area. And if there is empyzema or subcutaneous empyzema, expect that there is a gas-forming bacteria. Okay? Now, another is tenderness beyond areas of erythema. Halimbawa, yung erythema mo is nasa elbow lang. Tapos, pag pinapalpate mo ang forearm ng patient, tender pa rin siya. Meaning, expect there is also a complicated suspicion infection the patient and rapidly progressing necrosis or erythema. Mamay, after two hours, ayan na, mas malaki na yung coverage niya. One to two centimeters na difference. Malaki yan. Mabilis yan. Unlike with some others na how many days pa, dun pa lang nagpapogress. So, what is the management for skin and soft tissue infection? Again, number one, source control. Kung ano ang ma... If, uh, what is the most important in this uh, um, in this topic is source control. <coughs> Hindi mag improve ang patient if you are not able to uh, remove the areas of necrosis. Okay? So, here, immediate surgical intervention then antibiotic therapy. So, you must, pag necrotizing fasciitis or complicated soft tissue infection, broad spectrum ka agad in the form of Piperacillin, Tazobactam, Meropenem, Carbapenem, Imipenem, lahat ng yan. Vancomycin. That is, those, those are part of um, empiric therapy. Again, before you start um, empiric therapy, always get blood culture on these patients para ma-tailor down mo ang yung management. Remember, as we have discussed a while ago, last meeting, empiric therapy should only uh, last for up to 3 to 5 days. Then it should be tailored down kung may culture result ng pasyente. Okay? <clears throat> so, for skin and soft tissue infection, always cover uh, MRSA or the methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus and the other one which is the beta-lactamase producing uh, Klebsiella. <clears throat> so, Tapos na tayo sa skin and soft tissue infection. Do you have questions at this point? Kamingaw man. So if you have no questions, I may, may proceed to the next. So post-operative nosocomial infection. Okay? So this is also important because it increases out it increases the morbidity and it wait lang mali. Uh, nosocomial infections increases the hospital stay of the patient and the hospital cost of these patients by adding the morbidity morbidity to our patient. Simple lang yan, but it, it would prolong the patient stay. Like for example, SSI. So, we've already discussed about SSI, then UTI. <clears throat> okay? UTI here, ang treatment sa UTI here is only for post-operative nosocomial infection. Okay? Which is caused about by the indwelling catheters, like the polybag. Okay? Another one is pneumonia. Okay? For pneumonia, um, patients who are bedridden are very prone to pneumonia. So, that is why kung your patient is already post-operatively, dapat nakaupo na ang pasyente mo, dapat hindi siya nakaga, and dapat, if possible, 24 hours post-op, naglalakad na ang pasyente mo. Okay? <clears throat> Bacteremia can be caused by your IV. Okay? Kung in-diet na yung patient mo, you, know, you have no more, um, you have no more indications for IV antibiotics, then discontinue your IV and shift it to oral. Okay? So, sepsis. So, now, for the sepsis, we have the surviving sepsis guidelines. Um, it can be classified as either initial evaluation and infection issues. 
hemodynamic support and adjunctive therapy then other supportive therapy so for initial so initial resuscitation or fluids then diagnosis antibiotic therapy and social control nasa initial pa lang sila okay for patient to are septic so for initial uh, resuscitation it is giving up 30 30 cc of uh 30 cc per mil or per kilo sa patient for the next 3 hours okay until mag respond again for fluid resuscitation for fluid resuscitation um <clears throat> You call this one for fluid resuscitation. You must check first if your patient is a fluid responder or not. Because if they are not fluid responder, they are not going to your resuscitation or your fluid bolus won't, will be meaningless. Now, for diagnosis, you must one. You must um, your what's the right term for that? Sorry, um, expand all. Kuan, all means to find the source of infection of this patient. Antibiotic therapy, we've already discussed that, and source control. For hemodynamic support and injunctive therapy, for fluid therapy, know when you will, uh, know when you will um, to maintain your fluid, know when you will decrease, or know when you will increase your fluid, maintain your fluid, and when to stop to giving your fluid. Now, for vasopressors, uh, we can either use, the first line is norepinephrine. Second would be dopamine. And third, oh, no. First line is norepinephrine followed by vasopressin. Okay? Then next would be dopamine. Wala na, wala na tayong kidney dose. Ha? Before, uh, dopamine has three, one, three dosing. The kidney dose, the cardiac dose, and the vasopressor dose. Ngayon, wala na. Vasopressor dose na lang tayo. Then, there are also uh, studies regarding steroids. Kapag hindi na pa nag improve ang patient mo, we give uh, corticosteroids on this patient. <clears throat> okay? <clears throat> Next would be other supportive therapy in the form of blood product administration. So, for blood products, PAC-RBC lang binibigay natin. Only for uh, severely anemic people who are experiencing um, shock. Next would be mechanical ventilation. So, um, for patients who are having kuan, who are in, cannot, or cannot tolerate, uh, no, for tachypnic or mga bagsak nag-desaturation yung patient, nag-ventilate tayo sa patient. Sedation for those who are having encephalopathy and glucose control, which we've already discussed, and deep vein thrombosis prophylaxis and limitation of support. <coughs> when you say limitation of support, sinasabihan lang natin yung patients natin with regards to how yung family, what to expect on this patient. Now others, uh, mga kwan lang to, resistant organism, these are the MRSA or the methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, then the ESBL or the extended spectrum of beta-lactamase producing strains. These are the Klebsiella, Enterobacteriaceae. Next would be the blood-borne pathogens in the form of HIV, Hep B, Hep C, Hep A. That yan. They, they are very <coughs> um, significant sa atin since we are very high risk of contracting these diseases since tayo ay nag -opera. Next would be bi biologic warfare agents in the form of anthrax, Yersinia pestis, smallpox or variola, and Francisella tularensis or your tularemia. Okay? You don't, hindi ko na sila i-specify ang mga to kasi hindi naman tayo microbiology. So micro microbiology i-specify ang mga to. So then we just have to know that there is this biological warfare agents which can probably be significant. Now that ends my topic on surgical infections. Any question? Mabilis ba ako? <clears throat> or nakakalanat la ka mo? Okay lang, Doc. Kalanat man po, Doc. So any questions with regard to the topic?
Sauk ho wala ko dakay story ya. Mamingaw man. Sige, kung waray na ni questions. I think I would end here. Okay? So I'll see no. So for the exams, just study Schwartz, okay? Doon lang ako kukuha for your exam. Okay? <clears throat> okay, Doc. Doc, mas screenshot ko. Ano na yun ako. Okay. One, two, three. First page. Second page. Third page. Fourth page. Last page. Thank you. Thank you, po, Doc. Bye. Bye, po. Thank you, Doc. 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 Thank you, Doc.